Right. Good evening and welcome uh, to this 2021 Wisconsin Forest History webinar. Uh, my name is Don Schnitzler. I am a member of the Forest History Association of Wisconsin's Board of Directors. And on behalf of the association, I'd like to welcome you to this evening's presentation entitled Attracting Wildlife to Your Woodlands. Our speaker tonight is Jamie Knack. Uh, she is an Extension Senior Wildlife Outreach Specialist in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her work involves developing and delivering educational programs to youth and adult learners on the ecology, management, uh, and conservation of wildlife. She is also the state coordinator for the Wisconsin Coverts Project, a woodland wildlife management program for private land owners. Before our presentation begins tonight, a couple brief comments uh, to aid in the successful operation of the webinar as we go through it. First, if you have questions during the presentation, we ask that you use the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen to type in those questions. We will have people moderating those and uh, relay them to the speaker at the end of the presentation. We also want you to use that chat feature if problems arise that if you're not familiar with the Zoom platform or if you have questions about how to uh, do things during the conference, type them in there and we will watch for that so we can help uh, make sure that you have a good experience tonight. Uh, since I look forward to, and I'm sure you look forward to learning about attracting wildlife to your woodlands, I will turn this over to Jamie Knack and let her go. So Jamie. Okay, thank you very much, Don and Tom for the introduction and for helping to get this all started. I'm just working on sharing my screen here. Okay. Can you verify, Don, that you can see the Yes, I can. Slide? Okay, excellent. I am so going again, to mute myself now. Okay, perfect. So again, thank you for joining me tonight. Um, I wanted to start out a little bit uh, talking about kind of um, wildlife management in terms of goal setting. And so I pulled some data from the National Woodland Owner Survey, which I, I believe most of you are probably familiar with that is done um, pretty regularly. But in the nation, 36% of the nation's forests and woodlands are owned by families and individuals, like many of you on the webinar tonight. When we ask them what their primary reason for land ownership is, we get the following answers um, for the beauty, for wildlife, for the legacy, for nature and privacy. And so what's interesting to note is that financial gain from their land through timber harvesting or other activities is usually not the primary reason that they own the property, but it often is a pretty important reason in terms of being able to um, pay for the property. And so um, many landowners say that seeing wildlife is among the things that they most enjoy about their land. And whether that's, be, uh, whether that's turkey or deer hunting during the hunting season or watching migratory songbirds at this time of the year and again in the fall. Um, for me personally, I really enjoy working with private landowners and certainly with Extension and the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology where I work. It's really important with wildlife being a public trust resource it resides on both public and private lands. It's important that agencies and organizations work with private landowners to help provide information on how they can manage wildlife with their goals in mind, and also for us to provide resources and um, technical and financial assistance for landowners as well. So I'm very happy to be here talking with you tonight. A few um, principles I wanted to get out of the way here, but managing for wildlife can absolutely be compatible with other goals you have for your property. And it's the notion that good forest management is good wildlife management. Very, not very often do they conflict, but we may need to prioritize or you may need to prioritize your goals in cases of certain management options. And I'll give you a couple of examples here. Let's say you have a pine plantation and your primary goal is um, income from timber production. That really is a case where um, there's very little return from a wildlife standpoint. 
in a monotypic stand of red pine. So certainly some species, but not providing a lot of diversity in habitat or species um, for wildlife. And again, if timber management is your, is your primary goal, then wildlife may be second and may not have a whole lot that you can do with, with wildlife in that particular situation. And then this picture here, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the term wolf tree, but a wolf tree, um, the term wolf tree comes from how many landowners and foresters used to view them, kind of the big bad wolf. They were trees that were targeted for removal because they often had short trunks that were useless for lumber, very wide branching shapes that took up a lot of the canopy and prevented profitable trees that could grow underneath. Um, and yet, when we look at this from a wildlife standpoint, these are amazing specimens. They tend to be, this, in this case, this is a white oak, tends to be um, this particular tree when they get to this age, tend to be good producers of mast, which is really important for wildlife. Um, apart from their sheer size, their age gives them structural features that younger trees lack. So for instance, wolf trees often have some dead limbs and those limbs attract insects that in turn draw in woodpeckers and small mammals. And they may also have loose bark that can be attractive for, brood, um, for bats for a summer roost location. And these are often limbs um, and branches that serve as excellent roosting spots for um, wild turkeys. And another example of kind of trying to balance what your woodland and wildlife management goals may be would be, let's say you have 40 acres of woodland and from a wildlife standpoint, you wanna manage for interior forest songbirds or songbird diversity. You'd like to have thrushes and vireos well, maybe you're also managing and harvesting timber um, and have a recreational trail that goes throughout that 40 acres. So the more fragmented it is, the less, um, the less potential it has for those interior dependent forest birds. But on the flip side, you're gonna attract a lot of other wildlife in that habitat as well. So sometimes our goals, between forest and wildlife management may not be compatible, um, but for the vast majority of times, we can, we can find compatibility there. So I think this is fairly intuitive. Um, both my husband and I work in the wildlife field. These are pictures of my family, my kids. We enjoy being outside. To me, it's a no brainer on you know, why to manage for wildlife. And I'm sure many of you um, can resonate with some of these um, the list here on the left in terms of the benefits that you can gain from managing for wildlife. In terms of what it involves, sometimes it's just simply protecting what you already have. It could be tweaking or just maybe some slight enhancements um, to the property you have, or perhaps creating additional property. And even if we talk about um, on a backyard scale, even in a quarter acre backyard, we can do a lot to attract wildlife. We can turn some of that lawn area into native vegetation that'll, that will attract wildlife. And the same thing if you have larger acreage, if you wanted to restore a prairie or um, start a new tree planting and so on. There's a lot that we can do to create habitat as well. And in many cases, it's simply choosing land use practices and other management measures that will benefit wildlife. So perhaps reducing or eliminating the use of herbicides and pesticides and learning about the wildlife we wanna attract and finding out what is that missing element that prevents that animal from residing or visiting, spending time on your property. Is there food lacking? Is there shelter lacking? Um, what can we do to maybe attract more wildlife? So I just throw this number up there, um, this slide up here to show you the diversity that we have in Wisconsin of wildlife species. So between 300 and 400 birds, it kind of depends on the time of year that we're doing the counting with migration. Mammals, about 72. Reptiles, these include four species of lizards, 12 turtles, and about 20 snakes. 
And then amphibians, this is the single toad species that we have, about um, 11 frogs and another seven or eight salamanders. So the big question is that I would ask you is what would you like to manage for? Um, now is probably a good time just to just to mention we can't we can't we can't have it all. We have to kind of pick and choose. And the habitat management that we do, there will be winners and losers when it comes to the wildlife that respond. And I'll I'll share that. Um, I'll show you a slide in a little bit that um, depicts that a little bit better. But it's up to you, the landowner. So this is the pros and cons of owning land. You get to have that um, opportunity to decide what you wanna manage for on your property. And yet for many landowners, that feels a bit overwhelming um, to have that much control over the wildlife in, in your area. But you can think about, you know, are you interested in um, perhaps a hunted species, which can be common for landowners. So whether it's rough grouse or wild turkey or deer or waterfall, um, or are you really interested in songbirds and would like to have as much diversity in songbirds as possible? Um, other things to manage for, I mean, perhaps you're managing for firewood on your property too that you wanna harvest. So it is definitely possible for you to have several goals, some including wildlife and others forestry or um, other, other goals for your property as well. So that's a question you really need to kind of ask yourself. But then we need to be mindful about where in the state your property is located. So I think most of you are probably familiar with the tension zone. That's a band of vegetation or it represents a change in vegetation as you move from southern Wisconsin into northern Wisconsin. And with that change in vegetation comes a change in some wildlife species. Um, so there's a climatic gradient there with cooler and moister conditions to the north, relatively warmer and drier conditions to the south. And that tension zone is where we see a range shift or change for some wildlife. So if you think about common loons and rough grouse and ospreys and ravens, white-throated sparrows, more of northern species, um, along with uh, snowshoe hares and porcupines, red squirrels, and so on. So where you are, where your property is in the state can already have an impact on what you can expect to attract to your property. And then further, if you wanted to look into the ecological region, so the Department of Natural Resources has defined 16 ecological regions in the state. And if you take a look at the region your property is in, you can actually go to the DNR website and click on these um, pieces of the map and it'll talk about some of the ecological attributes and management opportunities for that particular area of the state. And again, a lot of it, we're talking about potential for plants and soil, you know, soil types, and then of course the wildlife um, respond from there. So some landowners choose to manage for a featured species. They bought their property for deer hunting and they're gonna manage for deer and any other wildlife response that comes as a, as a fact of that management is just a bonus. They're, you know, they may not even pay attention to it. So some will manage for a featured species. Some will choose to manage for a group or a guild. So I talked about forest interior birds earlier. That would be a forestry example. But some folks would like to maybe restore native prairie and, and the species of small mammals and birds that are associated with a prairie. And then there's probably, this is probably where I fall, but species diversity. I realize I'm not maybe going to be able to manage, I, I'm not, I'm going to, there's going to be some losers, some species I'm not going to be able to attract to the property, but I want to see as many different species as possible. And so I'm going to have, you know, in an ideal world, different types of habitat. So wetland and forest and grassland and within the forest community have different age classes and stand types of forests to attract the most diversity of wildlife species. So once you've given some thought to what you'd like to manage for, then you're gonna need to kind of learn about that animal. So if it's a specific animal or it's a group of animals that you wanna manage for, um, depending on that, that species, there are organizations in the state that you might want to look to. So if you are interested in turkeys, the Turkey Federation has 
great information on their website for managing habitat for, for turkeys. Um, the Bluebird Restoration Association, um, if you wanted to set up a bluebird trail of nest boxes, that would be a great place to go and look there as well. So again, depending on the species, you're gonna to wanna to do some, some background information and see what their needs are. And this is the graph I referenced earlier, but this just kind of illustrates that as succession, so succession is the advancement or the changing of the plant community from the left side of our screen to the right side, um, naturally this succession is taking place. Management can set back succession, whether that's timber harvest or a controlled burn, or in some cases grazing, um, physical management can set that back. So you also can kind of decide, you could choose instead of the wildlife, you could choose the habitat type you want and then maintain for that. Um, so again, though, it, it explains that, you know, grasshopper sparrows and meadowlarks and bobolinks, you're gonna see those in grasslands, but as soon as you have some shrubby encroachment, those species are no longer gonna select for those sites. Um, and then there are certainly some species, I think deer certainly fall in there where they either have a large enough home range or are generalists in terms of their food and, and the habitat that they are willing to live in, where we find them in just about all habitat types. So this really comes down to, and where I'll focus the rest of the time here is on, on habitat. It's that old adage, if you build it, they will come. So what I thought I would do is spend time realizing that some of you have a backyard habitat, maybe a quarter acre, half acre backyard, or 160 acres to work with. No matter what the size, we can use the same principles just applied at different scales to add more habitat and increase more wildlife on the property. And I probably should mention this because I get this question a fair amount is, somebody asking, why would I want to attract wildlife? I have enough problems with wildlife in my backyard or on my property. And if you really think about it, of those 500 species of wildlife I referenced earlier, there's only a handful, maybe, maybe a dozen or so, that are common nuisance problems that, that we see in the, damage, in the damage area. So whether that be raccoons or squirrels in the attic, um, deer damage, things like that you can certainly continue to attract wildlife um, and we can look for ways to mitigate some of that damage. So don't, don't, you know, don't hesitate to attract all those different songbirds um, throughout the fall and, and spring migrations. So all wildlife have the same four habitat needs, food, water, shelter or cover, we'll use those terms interchangeably, and then also living space. So when it comes to food, every species needs food, but they have their own specific food requirements. So you're gonna learn quickly here that diversity is the key with attracting wildlife. But if you can provide and think about food in a variety of different types, that, that's how we wanna think about diversifying the food that's available. So first of all, we've got fruits and berries, grains and seeds, nuts and acorns, nectar sources for those hummingbirds and pollinators, um, browse plants and forage plants like grasses and legumes. And then when we select for those plants, we also want to select plants that flower and bear their fruit at different times of the year. We don't want to select plants that are all providing food in the spring and no trees or shrubs that hang on to their fruits into the fall or winter like mountain ash that provide a late winter or a late fall um, food source. So um, animals also can switch their diet throughout the year. So for example, robins are gonna feed on insects and worms during the summer, real high protein. And then come fall, uh, they're gonna switch to fruits. Similarly, rough grouse and deer, they're gonna feed on all kinds of vegetation during the summer, like buds and fruits and mushrooms and greens. But come winter, they're going to primarily browse on shrubs, white cedar, woody material, and um, grouse are going to feed on flower buds of mature um, male aspen, um, hazelbrush, and species like that. 
And then keep in mind that many insects and invertebrates are attracted to the trees and shrubs that we provide. And those insects are also a food source for many species of wildlife. And um, again, regardless of your goals for your property, whether it is a forestry as a forest management as a primary goal or wildlife management as a primary goal, I think we can all agree that removing non-natives um, is really, is really um, a uniform goal. And lots of reasons when we think about it from a wildlife standpoint, we know that native plants are better adapted to the local climate and soils. Most of the insects we talked about on the last slide that are important food sources prefer a native host plant. Native wildflowers often produce more nectar for hummingbirds than the cultivated hybrids. And then lastly, more species and greater numbers of birds occur in areas with native vegetation than in areas where we have exotic or non-natives. And I think that probably is a result of, if you think about where you have non-natives or invasives, they tend to be kind of monotypic stands, so not a lot of diversity. And I just throw this um, list up here, but here are some native um, trees and shrubs, and there's also lists for grasses and vines um, as well. But I'm gonna go through a couple of resources on the next slides that I wanted to draw attention to that are, are particularly good for finding plants um, that are important for wildlife. So Marriott Nowak, um, she wrote this, this is just maybe like a 12 page publication for the Wisconsin Society for Ornithology. And I really, really like it. I like it because it splits the species of trees and shrubs by the time of the year that the fruit or the seeds or the mast is available. And this is just a screenshot of one of the pages, but you can see summer fruit. These are trees to consider, black cherry, pin cherry, red mulberry. And then she adds some anecdotal or some additional information here about the types of birds that respond or you know, will consume that fruit um, number of species. And I, I just, I really like this um, particular publication and probably the best thing to get to it is a Google search. Um, it's beyond the bird feeder, creating a bird friendly yard with native Wisconsin plants. And if you typed in um, NOAC, her last name, or just the uh, acronym WSO for Wisconsin Society for Ornithology, I think it would come up as one of the first um, links in the search. And if you get interested in it from looking at those maybe dozen pages or so, she also has a book published on birdscaping in the Midwest. Um, this is actually her second edition. It's a guide to gardening with native plants to attract birds and um, that would be, you know, if, if you really get into it, I would, I would get the book. Another source um, of information is if you were to go to the Wisconsin DNR's website, and in the search box, just type in keywords native plants, and it'll bring you to this web page. Again, this is just a screenshot. You could scroll down and there'd be even more information and even a video, but they have um, some short PDFs on for instance, if you want to attract monarchs or pollinators or birds, there's some handouts, some short handouts on the types of plants to plant for. And then I don't know if you can see my mouse here, but where it says buy native plants, if you click on this Wisconsin native plant nurseries, it opens up to a PDF that's updated annually where you can search for nurseries where you can buy native trees and shrubs and forbs in Wisconsin. And then I'm guessing many of you being forest owners are aware that the state has a tree and shrub seedling program or a state nursery program. And within that, you can also get um, wildlife shrubs or shrub packets. And maybe, so I advance the slide here, um, maybe you'd be interested in getting a packet of shrubs to put in a shelter belt or in an area that kind of feathers an edge from the forest to maybe an agricultural field. You wanna add some additional shrubs for cover um, and for, for food as well. 
And so DNR typically is selling um, choke cherry and a couple species of dogwood, hazelnut, and nine bark. And another excellent publication that um, talks about these various species, talks about where to locate your plantings, spacing, site prepar preparation, developing a tree um, planting plan, is this woody cover for wildlife? And again, going to the DNR website and just typing in woody cover for wildlife in the search box, you'll get to this um, really nicely done um, publication. And then before I leave um, food, I wanted to just mention some thoughts about bird feeding. And so you are certainly welcome, and, and I feed birds, a lot of people feed birds, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, there's certainly responsibility that comes along with feeding birds in terms of making sure you're keeping your feeders clean and that they're not serving as a source of disease spread and, and things like that. But we should probably know that, the, and we probably do, the, the real benefit of bird feeders and bird feeding is our own, our own personal benefit. We love to see those birds up close, um, especially during the long, long days of winter. Um, habitat management overall, when you think about the cost we spend on sunflower and thistle, habitat management is going to be a long-term better investment for us. So planting those native trees and shrubs. Um, and many, many, many species of birds never use feeders. They simply don't visit bird feeders. And even the ones that do, they get a relatively small proportion of their diet from bird feeders. They still are preferring native vegetation and, and um, getting access to food in other, in other ways. So. so we'll move on to talking about water. And drinking water is usually not a concern for wildlife in Wisconsin. Some animals rarely drink, getting water instead from the food they eat or as a byproduct of metabolism. For the rest, a creek or a lake or a marsh is usually nearby. However, you as a landowner can increase the local wildlife diversity considerably by simply adding a backyard pond, um, you know, a landscape pond, or looking at doing um, a shallow scrape for wildlife. And there's a number of different cost share programs that you can look into um, to support that, you know, the creation of that habitat. And then um, if you have the ability to supply moving water, that again seems to be very attractive uh, for wildlife. But adding a water feature, having a pond on your property um, certainly increases the number of species you can expect from bats, um, getting insects, uh, hatching off that water source. And of course, a lot of amphibians and turtles that will utilize that water. Then I'm going to spend some time on cover or shelter. And that's defined as basically any place that protects wildlife from predators and adverse weather conditions. Just like food, every species of wildlife has very specific individual cover requirements. And cover is particularly critical when animals are nesting and raising their young and when animals are just simply resting and conserving energy. Um, I think more animals likely succumb to exposure or lack of cover uh, than even um, food related, lack of food uh, in, in Wisconsin throughout the winter. So cover cover is really important. Some examples of things you can do within your woodlands. Um, if you have any existing stone walls or rock piles, um, it used to be in the area I grew up, rock fences were really, really common when landowners cleared fields. They just piled up the rocks and created a fence row. Um, amazing habitat features for small mammals and um, other wildlife. But rock piles and stone walls can be examples of shelter. Um, building your own brush piles, and I'll have a slide here in a little bit to describe that. And then evergreens, conifers, um, planting dense shrubs that, that hold that snow that birds can get into and, and roost in those cold winter nights. And then dead wood. Uh, the picture in the lower right is a tree fall or a windfall. 
that even in itself provides this little microclimate for amphibians and insects that birds and, and other wildlife will utilize. So snags. Um, snags is just another term for a standing dead tree. Of all the things that you could do in your forest, if you simply retained snags, you would be amazed at the additional species of wildlife or the amount of activity that you see. Of those wildlife species we mentioned earlier for the list of 500 plus in the state, over 70 wildlife species, including birds, mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, will utilize a dead or dying tree at some point during that decaying process. So this can be counterintuitive if forestry is your goal. A lot of times um, logging or harvest, timber harvest involves maybe removing those or, or certainly not, um, maybe not protecting them. But working with your um, contract, retaining snags would be something I would definitely uh, have you consider if wildlife is, is one of your goals. And we need both hard and mast trees or snags and of different DBH, diameter at breast heights, different sizes for the different wildlife species. So something like uh, an owl is gonna need a little bit larger diameter tree than what a chickadee might utilize. And then another thing to do, whether this is in your yard, uh, this is probably more applicable to in your yard, is leaving some of the leaf litter on the, on the ground. My mom is notorious for raking the yard and blowing leaves until it's just all green. There's not a single leaf on the lawn. And yet, if she were to leave some of those leaves, it would provide foraging habitat for this woodpecker like the northern flicker that would forage through those leaves picking insects. So leaving some leaves is, is not a bad thing. Other things for cover, I'll, I'll mention these brush piles. So if you, instead of burning these, um, but when you have timber harvest uh, activities on your property, is to actually pile up some of those tops. And if you start with a solid base, like in the lower right-hand corner, where you're crisscrossing some larger diameter logs, or I've seen people use um, PVC pipe or corrugated tubing at the base. So starting with a really good base and then putting your tops on top of that base, it'll help always have um, some nooks and crannies at that bottom. For songbirds, so a lot of birds will utilize um, brush piles, again, for roosting sites and rabbits as well. So um, that's an option. If you happen to be uh, interested in snakes, you could build a snake hibernation mound. Um, and the way, they do, way you do that is you actually dig a pit because snakes need to get below the frost line to hibernate. And so you dig a pit and then you start with large debris like stumps or even concrete if you're trying to bury some old concrete sidewalk or something like that. And then slowly increase the, the size of the debris you're putting in there, gravel, leaves, sticks, and then pile it um, in kind of a mound shape. You'll eventually attract um, snakes to hibernate. And of course they're excellent with their rodent control so that's another option too. And then also for cover and shelter, you can supplement what is naturally available by adding artificial cavities. So some wildlife species like flying squirrels or bluebirds, wood ducks, owls, American kestrels, they'll utilize man-made nest boxes um, and so when I started early on about managing for wildlife, sometimes it, it is simply providing a missing element. So if you don't have snakes and cavities on your property, you can supplement that by adding a structure like a nest box. What you need to be careful about is that every species has a specific, through research we know has a specific, you know, kind of preference for, for their box, the size of their openings, the shape, you know, what we put in it, wood ducks, we put um, wood shavings in the bottom, other species that bring in their own nesting material. And so you wanna do some research and make sure um, you're using a good set of plans to build a species specific nest box. And then the picture on the lower left, of course, is a bat roosting box. Um, so not a nesting box, but where um, bats are gonna roost in the summer with 
after they've had their young. So again, that's another supplemental cavity that you could provide. And then the fourth component was space. And we only have so much space in terms of perhaps what we own or what exists. Um, but every species does have a unique pattern of space or territorial needs. And they, um, they may require more than what your property offers. So some species with larger home ranges may only ever be an occasional visitor to your backyard. But you could work with your neighbors and think about habitat on more of a landscape scale or a bigger scale and work to manage some of these larger ranging species um, together. Uh, so for example, turkeys, you may have that wolf tree or um, some nice white pines that turkeys are roosting on your property and yet you don't have any open fields. And when they have their, their young, their broods, they, the hen will lead them out to a field where they can pick insects. So they're gonna forage on high protein right away. And maybe that occurs on your neighbor's property. So again, we can think about space as only our property, but I encourage you to think about it in more of a landscape scale. And then just two other kind of principles here to finish this out, but uh, arrangement is important. So food, water, and shelter how we arrange those or intersperse those on your property um, will maximize the wildlife. So in the lower left corner, if you have food and food is A and D is shelter and B is water and C is maybe some more shelter, um, wildlife really have to move around quite a bit to go and get all of those resources. Where if you have a more intermixed, like the circle diagram, it makes it easier for wildlife to avoid predation, um, if they have, uh, if they are not an animal that has a large home range, it makes them easier, it makes them, makes it easier for them to find the resources they need. And then again, I just will leave you with the idea of diversity. So we think about plant diversity, we think about the story of um, the, the, the plight of the um, Dutch elm disease and, and planting only elm. So I think it resonates that to help protect against disease and insect pests, we want to plant a variety of species. But that's also true for wildlife. If we want to attract more wildlife, we want to have diversity in terms of the plants and the in, in terms of shelter and the food that we offer. Structural diversity is talking about that non-vegetative structure or the dead plant material. So we talked about like rock fences and fallen logs. Um, we refer to that as coarse woody debris, but material on the ground. So that level um, all the way up to the canopy um, and the structure that the trees are providing. And then vertical diversity, again, thinking from the ground up. So Forbes, well, and we have a number of species that nest on the ground, like woodcock and um, rough grouse and some of the other th songbirds all the way up to the shrub layer, like cardinals and robins, and then species that will nest higher up in the canopy. So again, with thinking back to that red pine plantation, I think you can see how that would be more of a desert for wildlife. Certainly gonna be some species in there, red squirrels, nuthatches, chickadees probably, um, but not the diversity that you would see um, with more structure and, and um, species diversity. All right, I will just take a little pause there. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about then is completely switching gears and I'll cover um, some questions and answers here hopefully at the end. Um, lots of really nice resources out there though um, for managing your property for wildlife. And I'm always happy to have you send me an email, give me a call and help um, point you in the right direction or answer questions that you may have um, on anything I covered. If you get really excited about managing for wildlife and you're up for an intensive three to four day weekend, um, annually we put on, I put on with help of colleagues here in the Department of Forest and Wildlife Ecology, the Wisconsin Coverts Project. And it's a three day workshop, costs including the lodging and the meals. Actually, we do all of our own cooking. Um, we go on some field trips, 
All of that is covered through workshop sponsors and a grant from the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. And so this is a program that's designed for private woodland owners who are interested in managing the abundance and the diversity of wildlife on their properties. And then we're limited in how many we can, how many people we can take in a year. Um, we can take about 25 to 30 landowners. And so we're really looking for folks who are um, willing to work on a management plan. So we do feel that having a management plan is critical to reaching your goals. Um, and then also folks that are connected to others in their community that would help share this information. So this is really a true extension train the trainer type workshop. We're hoping to take 25 people, provide lots of resources and information, and with the hopes that they'll share that information in their communities with neighbors and so on. And so this is just a list of some of the topics we cover, but we do a number of field trips as well. We go into the Northern Highland American Legion State Forest, and we visit a number of different stands to look at what the civil cultural or the harvest met um, method is for that particular stand and what we expect the wildlife response to be. So everything from um, an even age to an uneven aged um, managed stand. And again, what, what wildlife will respond. We also do a workshop that's a lot of fun on um, how to inventory and monitor wildlife. So we go out ahead of time and we set some small mammal traps and some traps for reptiles and amphibians and track stations and trail cameras. And then we bring the group out and we work through these stations to learn about how you would um, implement that on your own property um, to, to monitor, to first of all, inventory what species you have on your property. And then also as ways to monitor how your management is going. And so I'll leave this slide up for just a little bit here, but our next workshop is August 12th to the 15th. These are held in Woodruff, Wisconsin at Kemp Natural Resources Station. That's an agricultural research station of UW-Madison's. And then applications, you can either send me an email, my email is in the, on the bottom there, or you can simply go to the Coverts website. And if you don't wanna write that down, I would just do an internet search for a Wisconsin Coverts Project, and it should be the first, first um, thing that pops up for you. And you can download and print the applications right off the web page as well. And this is just uh, the front page that you'll see of the website itself. All right, so Don, I do not have any more slides. So would you like me to stop sharing? Um, sure, this is Tom. Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Giroux and I'm the, uh, on the board for the Forest History Association and I'll be kind of handling the chat portion of this webinar. And so um, being the manager of this, I always get to ask my question first. <laughs> There's gotta so, be some perks. So often we see woodland owners bring their uh, either European or urban aesthetic to their woodland and they want to uh, clean up everything after a timber sale and remove all the dead and dying material. And I think sometimes that's counter to some of the uh, wildlife needs. So maybe talk about that for a little bit. Sure. I, um... I find it disheartening. I don't know if I'm sure others have noticed too, but as you travel through the state, um, you see a lot of fence lines being removed between farm fields. And again, that's, you know, that's, that's habitat. And yet I certainly understand the production side and the other, you know, the other, the reasoning behind it. But, um, you know, thinking about the messy woods. I try to talk to my mom and convince her of this. You know, you might want to keep your bedroom neat, but you want to keep your woods a little messy. You want to have all those logs to um, be able to roll over and look for salamanders and these brush piles to jump on and see what comes out. Um, it, it's it's more diverse to look at too than just seeing straight through the understory of a sugar maple forest. So um, it really it really is important, and I think you'd be really 
shocked to see what just doing a few of these things can do for the that wildlife um, response. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, I mean, if you've ever seen salamanders migrate in the spring, it's the most amazing thing. Yeah. Uh, and you've got to have uh, down logs for salamanders. So yeah. uh, we did have a question here. Um, if I can get to it. Um, several questions. So there was one about how does COVID-19 affect the Coverts project? Uh, she was thinking of applying, but wasn't too sure. So what are your plans to address COVID uh, for that workshop? Yeah, thank you for that question. So we have had 26, so Coverts has been going on since 1994. We've had 26 consecutive workshops. Um, last year, I had a group of folks, you know, applied by June 15th and I waited and was really hopeful, but of course COVID, it was just not gonna become a reality. It's residential, we have an overnight um, lodging and so on. And so it was the first time that we had a, we had to cancel a workshop. So um, I have my fingers crossed. I am really hoping with the vaccine rollout um, that we will be able to offer the coverts workshop, perhaps with some modifications and of, of course adhering to guidelines with masking and, and so on. Um, but I have to follow the guidelines that UW-Madison and Extension put forward. And of course they work with the CDC and, and the state to um, set their guidelines. But right now Extension has made um, kind of plans through beginning of June. So I need to just kind of, I'll have to hold off and see how things go. But what I would do is encourage you to apply, fill out that application, and I'll have it in my file. And so this year, I reached out to everybody who had an application on file from last year and um, gave them the new information, and they had the opportunity to keep their application active. So I'd encourage you to apply, and I will do a good job of keeping you in the loop with um, what we can do. Uh, so the next uh, question on our list here is about uh, putting out fruit for Orioles and uh, putting out your hummingbird feeders. Uh, what's the timing for that uh, activity? Yeah, another really good question. My mom and I communicate um, when we see the first, you know, the first hummingbird. And our experience has been is we never get them out early enough. I get to May 1st and I hang my hummingbird feeder and darned if by the afternoon there isn't a hummingbird on it. And I feel bad that, you know, how long has it been hanging out waiting for me to get around to it? So um, depending on what our spring looks like and what the warm up looks like, I mean, for me, I'm going to be thinking about end of April this year, because when I when I put it up at the beginning of May last year, birds were on it right away. And Orioles will tech Typically, you're going to hear them. They've got a very pretty song and are pretty vocal. You're probably going to hear them or see them in your yard um, soon enough to, to know that it's time to go get those oranges out. But I, I generally put them both out at the same time. I also know that there's hummingbird uh, migration tracking websites you can go to. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of yeah. interesting to watch them on their way up. Uh, so from Elizabeth, is there a way to reduce certain species? For example, we have so many squirrels on our property. Yeah, so Elizabeth is probably not going to respond, be able to, I'm not going to be able to ask her a question. So, um, so sometimes that question is coming from kind of a suburban urban type um, environment where people are bird feeding are feeding birds a lot and so if we're in a city or a suburban area where you perhaps can't hunt um, or put pressure on them that way or there's not enough mammalian predators their populations can be can be pretty high and they can really cause some problems if you're in more of a rural setting um, certainly you can manage them i mean you you can harvest them um, you can trap them as well, but otherwise, if you're if you're feeding birds and the squirrels are attracted to the property because of that feeding activity, I would look at some squirrel-proof bird feeders that are made out of metal, and they have a counterweight. So there's a bar on them that when the bird steps on that bar or perches on that bar, it still has access to the food um, 
the feeder or the hopper. But if a squirrel were to get on there, it, it, the weight shuts the door to that feed. Um, or just thinking about how you're providing that food to deter squirrels. So um, trying to cover whether she's in a, in a woodland area or in more of a urban suburban type setting, but I'm happy to, you know, shoot me an email and I can continue to try to help you there. Uh, so um, there's a question here from Ed, what would you recommend to assist wildlife during the severe winter weather, but really cold weather we had this winter? Yeah, so I would say this winter hasn't been near as bad as some of the polar long polar vortex years I can think of in the past where we really were getting that question a lot. Um, I think we need to remember that wildlife are so well adapted to the, in, you know, to this winter weather. So whether it be in their coat or how they're able to um, shunt off blood to their extremities to keep their heart and their internal organs warmed, um, roosting together, Birds are, you know, fluff up their feathers to provide an insulating factor. There's lots of adaptations. I, I'd encourage you to, you know, take a look at it online. Winter, you know, winter wildlife adaptations. It's just amazing. Um, I've been attending a fair number of climate change webinars as well. And what was really striking to me is this idea that we think about snow as habitat itself and how important the amount of snow is whether it be a rough grouse that roosts, snow roosts, so they actually um, land on the ground or fly into the snow and, and use the snow's insulating factor to roost, or whether it be the insulating blanket that snow provides that prevents frost from going deep into the ground where it can be um, an issue for amphibians or turtles that are um, hibernating in the mud. So snow is important in that case. And then snow also provides this blanket uh, and a layer we call the subnivian layer. It's the layer between the snow and um, the ground surface. And so there's a number of animals um, like weasels and um, meadow voles that are active year round, but they're active in that subnivian layer. And so that snow, again, is something they actually rely on. So snowfall is important. Um, other things to assist them, don't get into feeding wildlife. I mean, feed the birds, that's great, but don't get into feeding deer um, and fox and raccoons and things like that. There's just too many negative things that can come from it, both from a human standpoint, but from the animal standpoint as well. Much better to go back to those native plants that we talked about and planting shrubs that bear fruit late into the winter or, um, and or um, these conifers. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it's actually the cover, the lack of cover um, that can be more harmful to wildlife than, than sometimes um, the lack of food. So more native plantings for sure. I think that's uh, wise to uh, concentrate on the habitat and improving the habitat and it'll help all the species the weather the winter weather. Uh, so. Uh, I think that's good advice. I, I love this question from Paul. It's not for you, it's for the Forest History Association. My, my kids took forever to get to bed. Whoops, where can I find a recording for this fabulous information? It's available and I'll bring up the slide here on the Forest History Association's uh, YouTube channel, and, which is available from their website. And so that information is coming up on the screen right now. And uh, let me see, I have to check to see if there's any more questions. There might be one more here. A lot of thank yous for uh, uh, your work uh, and uh, appreciations, uh, Jamie, for your presentation mostly. So I better check the Q&A because sometimes questions get into there. Uh, that looks good. And I think we've otherwise covered all the chat questions. So Donald? Okay. Oh, first off, Jamie, thank you. It was a great presentation. I love the pictures. Um, 
I'm sure that I speak for everyone that was listening tonight, that they also appreciate the information you shared. Uh, and one of the comments about being fabulous information, I have to agree, great stuff here. Um, in addition to thanking you, I also want to thank everyone who attended tonight. Uh, in order for these webinars to be successful for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin, we depend on participation from our members and people in the public who are interested in these topics. So thank you also. I also want to mention that we have another webinar uh, coming up next month. Uh, actually, the webinars for the Forest History Association are scheduled or set for the third Wednesday of each month at 6.30 p.m. throughout the rest of the year. And next month, we're going to be listening to uh, Peter Schrake. He's the current archivist at the Circus World Museum in Baraboo. But he's also an author and he wrote a book on um, uh, John Kinsey uh, and Indian age from Portage, Wisconsin. And he's going to be presenting a talk, Frontier Dip Diplomats or Agents of Empire, U.S. Indian Agents in Wisconsin, 1812 to 1845. So that link will be available on our Forest History Association website. Uh, and you can see the uh, address on the slide that's projected right now. It will also be posted on our Forest History Association uh, Facebook webpage and probably shared as an email for people who have attended past webinars for the Forest History Association of Wisconsin. Uh, and as always, the webinars are all recorded. They are available on our Forest History page and also on our YouTube channel. And with that, thanks again for attending. I look forward to seeing you next month or hearing our presentation next month. And so good night for tonight. And thank you again, Jamie. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. Um, I think we're done. So I'm going to end the program here. Thanks, everyone, again. Thanks, Jamie. Yeah, thank, thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. We appreciate you doing this for us. Thank you. No